Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives. So, Eleanor, I'll kick it over to you for uh, the start of the webinar. Great. Thank you all for joining. Um, we have a great series lined up that we're going to be doing this month. This kicks off the first, um, and the others will be happening in February. I hope you're able to join us for all of those. Jason, you want to jump to the next slide? Um, as Jason said, this is uh, from, coming from the National Health Council, and of course you see all of our patient group member logos here, um, and we're happy to recognize all of our, our, our members um, that, that are, have taken part in this, especially those that have been part of our Quality Patient Advisory Committee and other committees that we have on board that help us to pull these kinds of uh, programs together. So um, we have um, three parts, as I mentioned. Today is part one. It's an overview of alternative payment models. Um, then we will have part two on February 14th, and then we will have part three on February 28th. Today we're going to take a high-level view. We're going to take a, a, a look at what alternative payment models are and how they came about and why. Um, and then we will be, getting, we'll be digging a little deeper in the next two uh, parts of the series. So we're going to talk about a background on health, the healthcare environment and the concerns that have come about to make um, alternative payment models a focus. Um, in the past, we have incentivized volume over value and we've had some misaligned payment incentives, and we're going to talk a little bit about that and what, what that means and how that came about. And then we are looking at today um, and what's happening in the healthcare environment today, and that we are trying to incentivize value through these alternative payment models, and we'll dig in a little bit more on, on what those things are. So let's begin now with um, having a discussion about um, the, the, um, one of the big concerns that we're all very aware of in healthcare, and that has to do with the expenditures that we have in the United States on healthcare in general. You take a look at this um, figure in this graph, you'll see the percent, the, the uh, expenditures per capita per person in the United States, um, and, and the growth in those expenditures between 1960 and what's estimated to be in 2023. So um, in 2017, we can see that the estimate was um, was projected to be at 10. Uh, $10,000, 10, $10,942 per person, where back in 1960 it had been $147 per person. So you can see that, that that amount has definitely grown. And if you look along the bottom, you'll see what are national health expenditures as the percentage of the growth of the, the GDP, the gross domestic product. And you can see that's also grown. Um, and it, at, from, from a low of 5% in 1960 to um, 2017, 17.8, projected to reach 19.3 uh, in the year 2023. So these, um, these increasing costs are, of course, of significant concern, and they're part of a national debate in uh, politics and policy um, about what's going on here. Um, there's been various healthcare reform efforts to change uh, federal laws, state laws, to try to move us toward a value-based insurance design, partially because of these rapidly growing costs that we see and these rapidly growing expenses. So um, the, the, um, the many reasons that we see for, these, for this growth in um, these expenses, there are a number of reasons. Well, the first that we have to consider is that we have an aging population. And so, um, you know, part of this increase in spending is because we have uh, a growing elderly population. You know, when you have new medicines, new advances in healthcare, it leads to longer life expectancy. Um, and that longer life expectancy means that people will be spending more money on healthcare because they're around longer. And this is partially the case that we see now because we have the baby boomer generation. You know, ba baby boomers currently represent one out of five Americans. And so we have people living longer and more of them that we're caring for. Um, the population aging is only part of the story. We also see that we have um, new advances in medicines and innovations that are coming um, at, at high price tags. So when we look at something like personalized medicine or specialty pharmaceuticals, um, we are looking at some, med some treatments that are really going to be geared toward a smaller number of people and not the large numbers of people that we've seen in the past. So we might have seen um, a high cost item be only a few hundred dollars a month in the past, but it was spread, uh, it was something that was being spent on a large number of people. 
now many medications and treatments are costing thousands of dollars per month, but that's on a smaller number of people because they are more specialized in nature and they are more personalized for the individual. So, um, but those come at a high price tag. So that's another reason why we see high cost. And then um, a third part of the discussion is the misaligned payment incentives, as I mentioned earlier. You have to remember that um, it, it, it's, been, uh, it's been in the past that expenditure was equal to price times quantity. And it was this issue of quantity that we had a system that was incentivizing quantity of care. And if that quantity goes up, the expenditure goes up, regardless of whether or not the price was going up. And so we have these misaligned payment incentives that were encouraging an increase in quantity. Um, in the past, we relied on the fee-for-service model, and so I'm sure that many of you um, know that, that acronym very well, the FFS, you'll see in a number of, uh, of our slides, but also in a number of publications, meaning fee-for-service. And it was really like, um, like anything that was, um, you know, any treatment that that payment was, that that person was receiving, um, and, and, and all of those things, it was like being picked off a menu. You know, you'd pay this for this much, and you'd pay that for that much, but, um, but the numbers were, were always um, growing and getting higher because the incentive was to choose more and more and not to really think about value over volume. Next slide, please. So let's get to the heart of what we're going to be talking about today, and that is alternative payment models. So what is an alternative payment model? An, an, an alternative payment model, or APM, is a payment approach that gives incentive payments for providing high-quality and cost-efficient care. So rather than pay for quantity or volume, the incentive is for high-quality and cost efficiency. Alternative payment models, um, uh, now in the U.S., we've We've actually grown to the point that in 2016, we saw that 29% of U.S. healthcare payments were tied to alternative payment models. And this is quite remarkable that we've reached this point in a very short period of time, and, um, and that number is growing. The, um, this quote here comes from a report that was put together by um, a, a, a working group. So the, um, the healthcare payment Learning and Action Network was created by HHS. And part of that network is an alternative payment model framework and progressing tracking working group. So the working group produced a report, and this quote says, these results highlight the move away from a fee-for-service system that reimburses only on volume and the move toward, a, toward more patient-centered alternative payment model approaches. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk a little bit in this presentation about some other findings from this report. Next slide, please. So what do some of these alternative payment models look like? So as you see here, we've got a list of a few examples. Um, fee-for-service um, could be the, still the basis for the payment, but that fee-for-service payment has been adjusted based on quality reporting and or some performance metrics that that provider must reach. So, um, and, a, and a modified version of a fee-for-service payment. A second alternative is a fee-for-service payment, but with incentives such as shared savings or some penalties that get put into place. So what do we mean by that? It's the same fee-for-service structure, but if providers are actually providing efficient care and they're able to bring the cost down, they get to share in the savings that were generated by bringing those costs down. It gets distributed as a bonus incentive. If they don't bring the costs down, then there are penalties involved. So it's still based on a fee-for-service structure, but with different incentives. Lastly, there are new structures that are alternatives to fee-for-service that encourage high-value care, um, either within a budget or by capitation or through population management programs. So for example, paying uh, uh, per member per month type of payment, a capitated type of payment where you're managing the population to try to reach some quality, um, some quality me metrics or performance metrics. So these are some of the alternatives that you would see or some of the options that can be, um, that can be tried under alternative payment models. The next slide, please. 
So as I mentioned in that, in that earlier report that I was talking about, the one that comes from the, um, the Healthcare Payment Learning Action Network, or the LAN as it's called, um, they had categories. They created what they called categories of what payment models look like. So category one is a typical fee-for-service structure. There's no, um, there's no link to quality or value in this type of structure. Category two is fee-for-service, but it's linked to quality and value. So there are some uh, requirements that are part of category two. Category three is alternative payment models that are built on a fee-for-service architecture, so modifications to the fee-for-service structure. And then category four is very, is much more, it's a different approach, is that payment is not directly triggered by the service delivery, so not based on a fee-for-service architecture. It's something that's a little bit different, and it takes a completely different approach. It could be um, a, a value-based uh, payment approach. So keeping these four categories in mind, um, there was an, uh, a, a goal set in that by 2016, we would reach 30% of the payments in the U.S. tied to some type of APM, and that we would reach 50% by 2018. This would include public and private health plans and Medicaid and, um, and uh, Medicare. So those were the goals that were set. You go to the next slide, please. You see here in the results that actually in 2016, when the data were uh, analyzed for what had happened uh, to that point, you'll see that in 2016, only 43% were still in category one as those original fee-for-service payments in the old type of payment structure. That um, in category two, which is fee-for-service, but with some link to quality required as part of the program, we had hit 28%. And by 2016, in categories three and four, which are more of those novel approaches, we see 29% was hit by 2016. So we can see that we were well on our way in this country to really breaking away from the old fee-for-service payment structure. Next slide, please. CMS's goals for Medicare um, alternative payment models, they had set similar goals, 30% for Medicare in 2016 and also 50% for 2018. And in March of 2016, HHS, HHS announced that its goal had been reached. So we, they, they have been progressing. And they had reached the goals that they set out. And it is expected that in 2018, they will reach 50% of the payments being under an alternative payment model structure. So let's switch gears just a little bit now that we've reviewed some of the higher level um, information about what's been going on with a, a shift from fee-for-service or a, a, a incentives based on volume to switching to alternative payment models, um, incentives based on value and quality. And let's talk a little bit about why some of this came about in the last few years and why so much attention has been paid to this. Um, many of you will recognize the acronym SGR, which stands for Sustainable Growth Rate. Um, we had set about a, a structure for paying for um, physicians' payments, and it was put into place as far back as 1997 when Congress created a formula for, for physician payments, and it was called the Sustainable Growth Rate. And it actually set spending targets for physician services. And the formula that was put into place um, would, uh, would look at actual costs versus target costs. And if those target costs, if, excuse me, if the actual cost for Medicare spending came in under the target, then physician payment rates would go up for the following year. And that's depicted as the bottom part of this figure. However, if spending exceeded the target, rates would be reduced to make up the difference. So the idea was to compare the targets with the actuals and make adjustments accordingly for Medicare spending on physician services. Well, the concerns over the SGR began early in the 2000s when the calculation was yielding severe pay cuts because they were um, showing that the actual costs were much higher than targets and so the rates were going to be decreased. Um, over time, 
Congress stepped in with a number of short-term legislative fixes to avert what was referred to as, they were, they were, it, was, it was to avert the reductions, but it was often referred to as the DOC fixes. So these, um, these short-term Band-Aids, these DOC fixes, went on for a number of years, every year always trying to um, accommodate the fact that the, um, the rates were set to be sharply cut and that there was a fear that there would not be access for patients if physicians stopped accepting Medicare because of these severe cuts. Um, it also, the SGR formula never had incentives to provide any kind of control over the volume of services. And so um, it was going to be cutting payments without regard to the quality or the efficiency of care. What happened was that um, in 20, we had a series of legislative fixes until 2015, and then in 2015, the SGR was replaced with what is now called the Quality Payment Program. And the Quality Payment Program was actually put into place because of the passage of the Medicare Access and Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act of 2015. And of course, we all call that MACRA for short. And it was the MACRA legislation that said, okay, we're gonna discard this old SGR fee-for-service reimbursement model. We're gonna discard all that, and we're going to put the quality pay payment program into place. And with the quality payment program, it leaves providers with two choices. They can get paid through the alternative payment models, or they can get paid through the merit-based incentive payment system, and that's called MIPS for short. Um, the, um, under MACRA, uh, the payment to the individual clinicians is subject to adjustment depending upon whether or not they pick a MIPS program or if they pick an advanced alternative payment model. Um, and under advanced alternative payment models, you see things like accountable care organizations. So all of this happened since 2015, and it really is one of these major changes that we saw in our healthcare environment that got us to moving in the direction of alternative payment models to really tap into value for, uh, for the care and the payments that are being provided and, and, and concentrating on quality and stepping away from what was a fee-for-service based program um, and, and was really uh, dependent upon the volume of care and rather than the value of the, the uh, value of care. The next slide, please. So I'd like to now stop and introduce our two guest speakers that we have with us today. Adam Thompson is the Regional Partner Director, Northeast Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center and Kennedy Health Alliance Infectious Diseases. And Tanya Safer is Senior Health Policy Director of the National Kidney Foundation. They both are going to spend a few minutes talking to, uh, talking to us about um, the, the APMs and the idea of from, from volume to value um, from the perspective of their organizations and their experiences. And then we'll end with a Q&A session. I'm gonna turn it over to Adam now. Thanks, Eleanor. And Adam, you are now unmuted. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I am the Regional Director at the AIDS Education and Training Center. Uh, we are a part of the federal Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Uh, so the healthcare that we provide is all funded through taxpayer support, uh, which I think really frames what I want to sort of talk about today. Uh, as a person living with HIV myself, uh, I am keenly aware as a system worker how much uh, our care costs, as well as uh, being a patient myself, uh, how much the care costs out of my own pocket uh, versus what the, the clinic itself uh, provides through our federal funding. Uh, when I think about APMs, uh, next slide. When I think about APMs, to me, uh, as a patient and someone working in practice facilitation in the systems, uh, to me it's about money, right? I mean, Eleanor just did a great job of overviewing sort of the, the rising costs in healthcare and sort of showing the way these models are supposed to help us get a grip on that. Uh, but I think it's always keeping that focus uh, not just on the, the value that we're looking at, but I think when I work in systems and I talk to people trying to change their minds about these things, uh, I find that even as a patient, I'm having to make arguments uh, related to dollars and cents uh, and how the money is coming in and how we're going to save it. Uh, next slide. 
So I, I spend a lot of my time educating uh, folks about this kind of stuff uh, at a pretty basic level, uh, mostly introducing uh, clinicians, clinics, clinic directors, uh, as well as patient communities to this concept uh, of these shifts in our healthcare provision. Uh, and I, I'm a person that thinks examples really work best, uh, to take it out of the clouds uh, and really see what we're talking about. And for HIV, the example I like to give folks is the, the story of the CD4 count, uh, because it's a test that is very common for persons living with HIV. Uh, it's a laboratory test that we use to, at the beginning to determine uh, where in a disease state an individual was in relationship to their HIV. Uh, it was our critical factor in determining whether a person would be diagnosed with AIDS, uh, as well as just a, a marker of immune strength uh, that we would use as a guideline to provide other kinds of care. Uh, so it was a really important thing uh, for people. And if you speak to persons living with HIV, many of them will tell you, especially if they've been infected with the disease longer than, say, 15 years, that that CD4 count, that, that number, is of great value to them. Uh, it's how they know uh, what their health status is. And yet we know now uh, that the CD4 count is not actually uh, the greatest measure uh, for an individual's health status, that in HIV it's actually better to do the viral load. So we also kind of ended up with these places where we're almost a battle of lab tests. You know, what, where is the value? Uh, and next slide. This is kind of where we are now. Uh, previous clinical practice was that a CD4 count was uh, done at every encounter, and most persons living with HIV uh, were expected to have anywhere from two to four encounters. A CD4 test, uh, I went down to our clinic uh, to get the invoicing costs on this. They run anywhere from $30 to $60 uh, using grant funds, uh, working with the major uh, labs uh, that we utilize, both Quest and LabCorp. Uh, when we look at these alternative uh, things, it's trying to calculate uh, how much money are we potentially spending on a lab test uh, that may no longer be needed. Uh, the director of the federal HIV AIDS program sent a dear colleague letter around, I think it's 2007, 2008 at this point, telling individuals that the CD4 count was no longer a required element of our care, that, that a clinician could use it at their discretion, uh, but that it was not necessary for reporting purposes, and which is usually how we guide our care in HIV. So when you start looking uh, at the number of persons with HIV in this country, we've got around 1.1 million people, uh, and I did the math. If only half of those people were to receive a CD4 count a year, it was something like $333 million by the time you added it all up uh, with everyone's cost. Now, this is a test that folks don't potentially need. It's also a test that folks have done sometimes three, four times a year. Uh, as a person who was durably virally suppressed over the past 12 years, I can tell you 10 of those 12 years, I was still having four CD4 counts done a year. Uh, that is an exorbitant amount of money to be spending on a lab test uh, that doesn't really tell us anything. And yet, when I look at, at sort of the conversations about APMs, it's very up here, but I think we have to kind of bring it down here and show people what we're talking about. Otherwise, I don't know if we'll build the appropriate system to address this problem, uh, because I can still order a CD4 count and have the outcome that I'm wanting. So if you look at a merit-based payment, as long as I'm suppressed, uh, there's still these costs associated with these tests. Uh, but when you look at the fee-for-service model, we, we should be spending less uh, now that we know we don't need to sort of provide this test. And yet, uh, next slide. When this is our, our outcome in the country, meaning almost 50% of the persons living with HIV in the United States should be having one CD4 count a year, and I had a hard time backing into the data, uh, but the expectations are that an individual will have two visits with two CD4 counts. Individuals uh, who are not doing as well sometimes have four. And I started adding up the dollars, and it's a ridiculous amount of money that we're spending on people who don't need that, that test. Next slide. So what ends up happening uh, is that as a patient, when I look at this, uh, I think about it in two ways. One, uh, this is a federal program that is funded through taxpayer dollars, which means we are knowingly spending taxpayer resources uh, to provide care that we know uh, potentially doesn't tell us anything, uh, which means we're putting money uh, behind a test uh, regardless of its value. Uh, and then as a patient, uh, as a person who, and, and I, I will be transparent, I was, I was a patient of the Ryan White program. I think they do some of the best healthcare in this country, and every dime we give them is worth it. Uh, 
but I'm also recognize that we're stewards of that money, and when we see that we could be saving it, we should. Uh, as an individual who now has private health insurance and, and sort of is responsible for my care, uh, I think about these kinds of tests being ordered uh, now because I have to pay the copay on them. Like, this is part of my insurance plan that's costing me money because of an individual's habit, uh, because a clinician was used to running this test and still gets reimbursed for doing that test uh, through our program because we've not moved over to one of these alternative payment models. Next slide. And I think this is, uh, and this is my last slide on this, it's, it's really going to upend our system when we start talking about not just that we're affecting, you know, these, these value-based models or that we're looking to alternative payment, because at the end of the day, some of this is physician practice. This, this is how they care for their patients, uh, which requires a different kind of argument as well as a different kind of conversation sometimes. Uh, because when you put a patient at the center of a conversation of value, uh, what I've seen is that we tend to upend the system a bit uh, because what we find value in tends to be very different. Uh, and yet, this, this argument I've made about this CD4 count, everybody agrees. Uh, everyone is on board when I speak about it across the country, and yet there's no action that's taken to save those dollars. So I think while APMs are, are great, and, and I am all supportive of them, and I think the data coming out of them are really interesting and are really telling us a lot, I do think uh, we have to think about how they drop uh, at the physician and care team level and how that affects their practice and what, what things of our culture in healthcare need to be changed uh, beyond just the payment system so that we can foster the kind of environments that believe in these value-based outcomes uh, and can hear the patients when they're saying these things as well as listen to their system workers uh, who see where we could potentially save money by decreasing volume and focusing more on value. Please introduce Tanya, and Tanya, I will kick it away and let you do a, a quick uh, overview of yourself and your organization. Great. Thank you, Jason. Hi, this is Tanya Saffer. I'm the Senior Health, Health Policy Director for the National Kidney Foundation. So I don't think that this is breaking news to anybody on this phone call, but right now, healthcare, even though we are moving towards a different type of payment system, uh, healthcare delivery is really a tangled web for most patients. With patients, you know, and I put them as the smallest bubble, not because they should be the smallest bubble, because often I think as patients, people feel like the smallest bubble in this web of, you know, doctor's appointments, specialist appointments, hospital visits, um, surgical centers, lab tests, pharmacy visits. It's a lot for one person to, to navigate um, and to really take charge of their, their own care in this current fee-for-service system. Uh, so next slide. So I believe payment models are really ripe opportunities for, um, to improve patient experience and uh, patient care. And I don't think that they're just about payment, but really about incenting, uh, as Eleanor had said, incenting improvements in care delivery and, and really working to achieve better outcomes. I believe that they, they are holding um, and hold the promise of holding uh, practitioners accountable uh, for outcomes of patients, uh, not just treating what, you know, in the illness that is right there in front of them that the patient may have come in and complained about, um, but really treating the whole patient and really looking at total outcomes and really helping to take the lead in coordinating, coordinating care for that patient as well as, of course, accountability for costs. And, and really, I think the payment here and the cost accountability in these alternative payment models are providing sort of the resources and the incentive uh, necessary for providers to really take on a greater level of accountability in providing patient-centered care. Um, you know, models are testing new concepts, but some of this is, are revisions of old concepts as well, and I'll talk a little bit more, more about that. Um, these models are iterative, so even though we have things like accountable care organizations now, um, you know, those accountable care organizations are going through uh, changes, and you know, you're seeing the next generation of accountable care organizations. And so there are really opportunities here that even though we have these alternative payment models that exist, we know that there are new models coming on, online. We know that the models are changing as the process goes and as we learn more about what's working and what isn't um, in some of these models. And so the, my point there really is, is just because we have hit the ground running with these models doesn't mean that there isn't an opportunity for greater patient engagement um, moving forward. 
Um, and there is a recognized need for specialty models, which I think is really important to many of the patient groups that work with the National Health Council or that are members of the National Health Council, because most of you know, our organizations are focused on, on a special population that has unique needs but is battling a chronic condition. Um, so I think that you know, the future for alternative payment models, we will see more and more specialty models developed. And I think that that provides a great opportunity for patients to, to provide input into the design of those new models. Um, so I guess my, my take home message is I'm, I'm very optimistic about the opportunities that are here, but we definitely need to take advantage of them. Um, you know, we have, a pro, we have an opportunity for proactive patient advocacy as patient advocacy organizations to create patient-focused payment models, particularly in the area of specialty models. Next slide. So who is currently designing the alternative payment models that exist? So largely payers, largely providers, um, and, and more, I think, in, in some, you're more, um, Let's see, there's more emphasis on providers creating some of these models since they're the, the ones often accountable um, for the patient population. Uh, but not patients. There's, they're really not, you know, not a great involvement of patients in designing and developing these models to date. Um, you know, perceptions that are driving sort of the participation in the design of payment models right now from the payer perspective. Um, changing physician behavior to reduce spending and utilization. So we know that providers are the prescribers, the orders of the tests um, that we take, the, you know, the referrals that we receive as patients. Um, so I think from payers' per perspective, there's an opportunity in alternative payment models and, and certainly from the CMS perspective to change this physician behavior um, to create a greater accountability for spending and utilization so that we don't um, that we don't, as Adam was pointing out, you know, use unnecessary uh, resources that really are not making a difference in patient care. I think from providers that are, that are wanting to participate in this model or are hesitant to participate in these models, there is this thought that, yes, okay, accountability, great, but there's only so much they can do. They, they you know, they are very, this is a, quite a change in clinical practice to being completely accountable for a whole person care. And for many providers, they, you know, they're, they're used to the fee-for-service model. They're used to treating the illnesses in front of them. Uh, they're used to, you know, looking at the patient in the clinical setting and not really looking at the whole, the whole person and what else is influencing uh, that person's health outcomes beyond the clinical ailment in front of them. And so there's sometimes, you know, we often hear from providers that they can't change patient behavior and that there's only so much that they can do to really improve outcomes for patients. And so I think that's been a, a barrier um, in participation, but also one that could be overcome with, come with uh, more active patient involvement. Uh, I think for patients, and, and one of the reasons we see lack of involvement in these models, and, and not just in the design of the models, but actually patients see, the patients that are in these models already, um, many of them don't even know that they're in the models and probably are not as activated um, as other, you know, as they could be um, in, in really controlling, you know, healthcare spending, but also improving their own outcomes um, with the right tools and the right resources. I think there's, a, there's an opportunity here. Um, so right now, I think we see from patients, you know, lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, not just in alternative payment models, but in healthcare in general, um, lack of, you know, knowledge of, of what services they should be receiving, what they, what they may not need to be receiving, and really heavy deference to, to providers to guide them through this process and through, their health, through the healthcare system. Um, I think also as you talk about alternative payment models, um, there's this, there is a concern and, and about access to care and treatments, and many people still remember, you know, capitated payments um, and managed care as negative um, things that, that kept patients from accessing the medications and the treatments that they needed and gave patients fewer choices on, on what providers they could see. And so I think some of that, um, it, you know, I think that, that memory there and that experience there is, it, it's still there um, and, and is serving as a, as a barrier as well. Next slide. So value over volume, and, and Eleanor spoke a lot about this, um, and I think we all know this. Who is currently defining, defining value? In a lot of these, these models, um, and even in the MIPS program, the, 
the quality metrics are largely based on, on clinical evidence. Um, some models and, and some measures are now capturing patient experience data, largely um, through the, the CAPS patient experience survey. Um, the patient voice and defining value still is largely absent, um, and, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, and I mentioned, I don't even, you know, most patients don't even know when they are in an alternative payment model. Um, and most of these models are still built on fee for service with back end bonuses for, for savings achieved. Um, so, still very much the same incentives um, for volume, even in alternative payment models, are still there. Um, but there is this added incentive. Uh, to to be able to control costs because you maybe get a you're able to get a bonus on the back end. So I would say this is my point is, is this is sort of a slow evolving process and and it has a lot of positive aspects. Um, but we're still largely in a in a fee for service um, model right now for most of our healthcare. Um, active patient participation in these models because they don't know they're in them is is overlooked in a missed opportunity in missed opportunity. And care may not be considered, um, uh, care may not consider patients' goals or address the barriers that they might have to adherence. So going back to that, that provider, I can't change behavior, I can't get my, I can't necessarily make my patients um, follow my treatment regimen. Uh, really looking and trying to change the conversation uh, to more of a holistic, okay, well, why, why can't my patient um, take this treatment or, or follow this advice? What is the barrier that they're facing? And really having that deeper level of conversation. I think as we move more towards alternative payment models and more towards population-based models, those, there are opportunities for those conversations to start happening because I think, um, and I think we would, we would probably all, degree, all agree that the more you engage patients and the more you talk to them and really try to understand what's going on in their life and what their goals are, um, the more likely you are to see a path forward as a provider to prescribing a treatment or prescribing a care plan that will help patients overcome those barriers, but also help them achieve the goals that they have set that may have not anything to do necessarily with their health outcomes, but really are, you know, I just want to be able to continue working in this manner, or, you know, I really want to be able to continue playing soccer. And, and how do we have those conversations with patients? And I think these models as I said, are, are more, more than just payment, but the payment is driving the incentive to be able to um, really achieve some, some difficult barriers in reducing healthcare spending, but overall in improving outcomes for patients. And, and I think that we will be on a path towards recognition that these conversations need to happen. So I'm still optimistic. Next slide. Um, just to give you an example from the dialysis uh, world, uh, so again, before few, several years before we were saying things like alter, you know, using the phrase alternative payment model, um, the dialysis, uh, Medicare reimbursement for dialysis uh, for people that have kidney failure really is an alternative payment model that started in January of 2011. And this was, uh, you know, if you look at back at the map that Eleanor had um, shared from the LAN, this is really, you know, the, the payment system for dialysis is really an alternative payment model category two. It is a fee-for-service payment per treatment for each dialysis session, and that, that payment is adjusted um, by quality measures, and it is downward adjusted. So if you don't meet a performance score on a set of about 16 measures to date, um, you, you can receive a penalty of up to 2% as a dialysis facility. Um, the, this payment system is, is evolving. Um, there is now a pilot uh, program that looks very much like an accountable care organization for dialysis care. Uh, it's called the Comprehensive ESRD Care Initiative, and it forms what, you know, ESCOs, you know, end-stage renal disease seamless care organizations. Um, so again, like an ACO, but, but for dialysis patients. And this takes, is sort of another build upon the fee-for-service environment. So it takes both the, the prospective payment system, the quality incentive program, several other quality measures to create a quality performance score. And then also has the additive shared savings um, payments that dialysis facilities can um, 
can receive if they meet a certain threshold, uh, they come under a certain threshold of spending. So we're seeing the transformation, you know, again, in the dialysis space is sort of the first example of a specialty payment model starting in 2011 and now having, you know, a, a shared savings component to it for some um, clinics that have chosen to participate in the ESCO uh, program. So this, again, the, the model, you know, taking it to an ESCO or an ACO level for dialysis is really a voluntary pilot program and that started a couple of years ago. And so, so, you know, there are a few facilities across the country that are participating in this program now, but largely care for dialysis still remains under the, the Medicare um, fee-for-service uh, program with the quality incentive program uh, tied to those payments. Um, again, still even in, in dialysis, um, which to some extent is ahead of these alternative payment models, we see that the quality um, incentive program, the quality measures that are used for these programs are still largely defined by clinical measures, many still process. Um, now that we are seeing uh, CMS add patient satisfaction measures using the in-center hemodialysis CAP survey uh, responses, uh, that's really the only sort of patient reported outcome that is being tied to this, this payment system now. Uh, you know, CMS has tried to make it very transparent. So as we know, the new administration looks at, you know, look, is looking at innovation um, in the way of trying to make it more transparent so that patients have choices and, and can make choices about where to receive care based off of um, quality and based off of cost. Uh, and I think, you know, CMS for dialysis has also been trying to do that for a couple of years, but has made some very um, confusing moves in this, in this space and is now, you know, trying to backtrack and, and engage patients more because, you know, some of the programs that they have launched have been very confusing for patients. And I'll just give you one example, or I'll give you two examples. There are, there are two essential quality programs um, in dialysis. One is the quality incentive program, which is tied to the payment. Um, patients in their dialysis facility can see, and I, there's a very small picture of it here, can see a certificate that shows this dialysis facility score, uh, performance score on those measures. In addition, CMS decided, well, maybe that wasn't enough, and we should really design a star ratings program to be able to help patients compare dialysis facilities against each other so that they can really choose the best facility to go to. So they started a star ratings program. Those star ratings are not based on the quality improvement uh, score. They are based on similar quality measures, but the design of the score is com and how the star ratings are assigned is completely different. So now patients receive two pieces of information, and honestly, most of them, and we've done surveys, are not using either one to, to, to decide where they're receiving care. They're still really relying on their, their nephrologist to tell them where to go um, or picking the facility that's closest to them. So this was, you know, a really a missed opportunity that had CMS engaged patients in the beginning of the design of these quality programs and asked patients, you know, from the get-go, how can we make information about quality more transparent to you? How can we include um, measures that are actually meaningful to you that will help you make decisions about where you want to receive dialysis care, we might be a further along. CMS now is definitely working to try to fix this, this confusion, and they've heard it from patients, and they've heard, they, you know, they've heard it pretty much from everywhere in the, in the kidney community, that they realize their, their programs need to have more patient-reported measures. They you know, need to be easier for patients to understand. And they are now working to try to establish um, work groups with patients to work on the STAR ratings program um, and, you know, taking a lot of comment and input from patients and engaging technical expert panels that involve patients on developing new measures. Um, but it's still, you know, it, it's going to have a long way to go. And I think a lot of that, it's still confusing and not a great resource for patients to rely on today. Um, and I think, you know, trying to change it iteratively has, is likely going to cause a lot more confusion in the short term, and hopefully it'll get worked out in the long term. But just again, I point this out because it is an example of had we started with the patient in mind to begin with, 
we certainly would be much further along in the dialysis world in helping patients make informed decisions and really understand the quality of care delivered in a facility. Next slide. So all of that to say, really what we want to see is patients that this, we all want this on this call. I know that I don't need to tell you this. I'm going to hear it anyway. <laughs> we want patients at the center of healthcare. Um, and we want them at the center of healthcare where the provider is asking, what are your personal values? What are your goals? What do you do for a living? You know, what, you know, how important is you know, being able to continue doing that for a living to you when you're considering your treatment options? You know, what is your community like? What are resources are available to you? And what are your family dynamics? So looking at a patient not just, you know, as patient healthcare delivery, but the whole universe of what a patient goes through. I think the alternative payment models with greater patient engagement in the design of those, but also in the involvement and actual activation in these models can provide a great opportunity for patients to be able to experience this type of care delivery. Next slide. I think that might be it. Yep. Thank you, Tanya. Um, really appreciate uh, you sharing the, the case study and those experiences. And also, thank you for joining us on your birthday. So happy birthday to you. Um, I do want to Thanks. open it up for any questions um, from the, the audience. Um, if you can, please utilize the chat feature. Um, but right off the bat, I think one question for both of you, Tanya and Adam, um, came in really related to, and Eleanor also it was addressed to all three of you, but um, you know, in the next year or two, um, and even looking a little bit forward, what are you uh, most excited about as this, uh, as these things move forward? And what is sort of your your biggest thing you'd highlight as a concern that that needs uh, that's a gap, if you will? So well, I'm I'm happy to go ahead, Tanya. Go ahead. Oh, I'm happy to go start. Ahead. So I think. The, in the next two years, what I think I'm most excited to see, um, particularly from a perspective of, you know, an organization that focuses on people that have chronic conditions, is a, a larger focus um, of developing models in specialty care. I think that that is a, is a great opportunity for this community. I think the thing I'm most concerned about is that if we can go down the path of patients not being involved in that process, we start to see things that patients start to get apprehensive about, patient advocacy community in particular, um, you know, thinks is a threat to patient care. Um, and so really, you know, I think not getting involved from the get, getting patient advocacy involved from the get-go could be concerning when we start to see, and we may start to see more things like we saw with the Part B mandatory um, payment model that, you know, luckily got nixed, but, um, you know, we, we certainly don't want to see those kind of things happen again. We really, you know, want to take advantage of this opportunity to, to have patient engagement from the beginning. Yeah, this is Adam. I would, I would echo, one, the excitement about looking at specialty models. As a person in a specialty practice, trying to retrofit some of these things into the environment has been very difficult. Uh, the other thing that I think I'm excited about is there seems to be a bigger conversation that is advancing uh, about outcomes and what are the outcomes we're looking for and what is value to us. I, I think these are great conversations. As you heard me say, I'm, a, I'm all about the culture and I think this has forced that conversation and I think that is what I'm most excited about. Uh, what I think uh, maybe makes me a little bit nervous uh, is that this is really complicated uh, and trying to explain all of these things that are happening as they're happening at this breakneck speed uh, is very difficult. And, and so even when you have fully engaged patients and communities who want to be a part of this process, we've got the hospital administrators that don't understand some of this stuff. Uh, so I think the, the gap or my nervousness uh, sort of is similar to not having patients involved, which is not having us even understanding uh, what's going on around us as, as you're sort of getting very into the weeds about some of this stuff that system folks get, but when you're talking to me in the community level, I just have different, uh, I got different things I'm worried about. Uh, and so I think the, the concern I have is how do we fold all of these varying conversations together into one larger one and make sure that everyone who's part of that discussion is equally valued. Thanks, Eleanor, do you have anything to add? 
No, why don't you go on to the next question? I think it's an important one. Sure, yeah. The next question we got in the chat is, what's your advice for patient leaders trying to understand and stay involved in this topic so we can help our community? Communities. Uh, so, this, this is Adam. I would say I spend a lot of time with a dictionary uh, and reading <laughs> things and trying to figure out what it means. I also uh, have found it incredibly helpful to build a network uh, of different kinds of experts around me, people that I can lean into uh, to ask questions of. Uh, some of my people I went to college with who are physicians or nurses, uh, as well as the other people in my community of persons living with HIV. Uh, there's a lot of capacity sprinkled out there all over the place. There's just not a lot uh, of people who are tying it all together for us. I think webinars like this are, are a great step, uh, but I think it's, it's doing right now uh, what I think patient advocates have always had to do, which is, you know, keep your fingers in a lot of pots, keep your eyes in a lot of papers, uh, and ask a lot of questions uh, because it is changing so quickly uh, that by the time I feel like I understand something, there's a new idea on the table. So. Uh, that, that would be my terror. I think it's bad advice. I don't know if it's that very helpful, but it's advice. Uh, it's a lot of work, but I think it's, it's possible with, with networks and research. So I, I agree with Adam. I will add four things. One, continue to participate in the next two webinar series that the National Health Council puts Thanks, on. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Two, I would say follow what the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Innovation, also known as the Innovation Center, are doing. Um, take a look, read those models like Adam suggested. That's a good starting point. You know, take a look at what, you know, really what an accountable care organization looks like and, and maybe take a look at the oncology care model to get a good, you know, idea of what a, a specialty model looks like and certainly the ESCO model could be one too. Um, Follow the Healthcare Payment Learning Action Network. It's completely free to do this. Um, they contract with CMS. Um, it's, you know, they have an annual meeting that ha is really a good source of information of what's going on in this space, both in Medicare, Medicaid, but also in the private payer community. Um, I found that, and they even have, just go to their website and pull through their archives materials. They have great slide decks, um, great resources, read their white papers. I found it phenomenally helpful when I was first looking into this space. And, and just recognize this is a new area for everybody. So nobody really is, you know, an expert yet. You know, this is an evolving environment, but I found that that particular organization to be tremendously helpful. And then if you're looking, um, follow, you know, really wanting to get in the weeds and see the development and the creation and who's proposing new models. Um, the, physicianal, the Physician Technical Advisory Committee, which is known as PTAC, um, is, you know, a committee that was appointed to uh, look at models that are being submitted by external stakeholders and deliberate on those, those models. And so I find that, that website, which is run out of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at HHS, um, look at that, that web, the PTAP website, um, and it provides a lot of good, helpful information for this as well. I, I would add one thing in that is that, um, you know, as, as members of the National Health Council, reaching out to us and letting us know what you, um, you know, that this is an area, if there are areas that you want to learn more about, um, we can try to put together more uh, webinars like this and um, zero in on specific topics that people want to learn about. We tackled this one just at a high level and very general, uh, in a very general sense, uh, just because it was the first time that we were doing something like this. But certainly if something comes out of this discussion that people want us to get a little more granular on, we're happy to, to tackle that next topic for maybe another webinar series that could happen later in the year. Thanks, and I think we have time for this last question, um, and thanks for staying on. Uh, the question is, do you hear any concerns when making outcomes more, more transparent that care, care providers may try to avoid more severely ill patients with access to care implications? This Adam, it, it's already happening. Uh, there's definitely reports that folks are uh, firing patients or not putting them into their uh, panels because of either perceived bad behavior, unwillingness to move to the outcome. They have all kinds of reasons why they do it, but I think uh, the question is valid, uh, and it's a big concern, actually, I think, uh, and we have to find a way to sort of track uh, 
patient panels and how people are moving in and out and who presents and who's not asked back and why. I think more patient-centeredness kind of gets you there, that idea that you can charge me for a visit I wasn't there for without putting into context why I wasn't there. Uh, those kinds of shifts will help in this problem, but I think it's a very real concern, and I think it's something that uh, as patients, when we have really complicated health care, uh, it was already difficult for some of us to find providers, and now it's even more so, especially if they're going to be uh, disincentivized uh, to help people like us. I, I agree. I have nothing to add to that. I think that that was well stated. Thanks, Adam. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for your questions. If you do have any more, um, please feel free to, to email myself. It's Jason at jharris at nhcouncil.org or Katie, and we can follow up and get you answers from Adam, uh, Tanya, or Eleanor or connect you with them. Um, we've come to the, the end of this webinar, so we do want to uh, put a plug in, as Tanya mentioned, for the, the second part of our webinar, which will take place on Valentine's Day, and we'll have a, a great presentation lined up for you then. So I know um, you'll receive a calendar invite if you haven't just for being on this webinar. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Eleanor for the, uh, the, the close, and uh, we can get out of here on our Wednesday. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. I do want to thank our friends at Amgen because they actually were uh, the group that said to us, hey, we think this is a good topic. And when we asked around um, among members, they said, yes, it is something we want to know about. So thank you for prompting us um, to, to, to do something like this and giving us support to get it done. And, um, and we uh, look forward, forward to the next one on February 14th. So um, there will be uh, more announcements coming out about it so that you can register and you can, you can pass the information on to other people who might want to join. So thanks very much, everyone.